My guy doesn't make it, like KT. It bothers me every day still. One day I was showing the staff his highlights from high school. Then we decided what's wrong, you know. Watch him, man. He was so talented. I definitely looked up to him as a kid growing up. We was in a layup line. K got up and dunked the ball at 10 years old. <laughs> I was on my radar when he was in eighth grade, honestly, maybe seventh. Because as you remember, he was a man child even back then. He was birthed with that talent. That ain't nothing like you could just get taught. Great mid range. I know I can do this. Defense. I know I can do that. I really honestly felt like nobody could stop me. I could do whatever I wanted every time. I didn't care if my daddy was out there, I was going to attack him. This kid is a donkey machine. I'm past this of being the best player in the state. I want everybody to know I'm the best player in the country, and that was my whole drive going into my senior year. You can't forget about his legacy because for the simple fact that what he did for the city of Flint. Calvin Sorber is definitely a legend in my book. He had everything there was to have, and things just sometimes don't work out. They don't see what's behind closed doors or what that kid is going through. Well, here we go. Who talk about a trailer getting you fired up, man? That's, uh, <laughs> I'm super excited to uh, check the book out. So, joining us now on the podcast is Eric Woodyard. Uh, he's joined us before on the podcast. He's he's uh, an insider, uh, the Detroit Lions beat reporter for ESPN. But what we're bringing him on for this time around is that right there, that book that he is the author of, All In, The Kelvin Torbert Story. It's available now on Amazon, so go ahead, go check it out, pick it up. And uh, you've got a book signing in Flint on April 9th, you told us, so definitely mm -hmm. look into that too. So first of all, Eric, thanks for joining us. And you said that you've been working on this project since 2014. How, yeah. how good does it feel to just have it ready to go and you know people actually – reading it i think it'll feel better once we actually had a book release party you know what i mean because okay. like that'll be like the time we can really celebrate it um but yeah man we started way back then i want to do something like i always like doing things outside of like my day-to-day -day. so at the time i was working at the flint journal mlive.com and uh i, I wrote a, and i want to write a book i want to do something about somebody from the community that like kind of reintroducing somebody i mean we got we got a lot of great legendary players to come out of flint but a guy like him, I think it was one of those moments where you had to kind of be there to understand, like, and his story kind of just like, it, it, it lingered over the Michigan State program a lot, you know, just like with the younger guys like Miles Bridges and, you know, guys that were coming in, they were like, can Izzo coach five stars because of how what happened with KT? He could have went directly to the NBA at high school easily, you know, and he decided not to. And it was like one of the bigger mysteries of our community. And I watch a lot of these, you know, where are they now type things. And I just, I feel like that would be a great story to tell. But he's very close. Like, KT can be real. Um, he's not super open, you know what I mean? So it took time for our relationship to develop to really get a lot of stuff out of him. And now we had a project where I feel like we're really touching on some stuff and it's not like just a – you're not going to read this and be like, this is a PR thing or you just telling all the highlights. No, we're getting deep. We're getting vulnerable. We're touching on mental health, emotional, you know, dealing with trauma, what, you know, the expectations people put on you from being a kid, you know, going through uh, 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 the end of a relationship after you've been with somebody – nearly 20 years you know we get into parenting you know it's a lot of different things and it's an african-american man you know so just navigating all that being african-american i think we're touching on some real themes and i hope people when they get done reading this uh they leave with a deeper understanding not only him but just a lot of young athletes uh in in, in situations like this i've heard a lot about uh torber honestly only recently since we last talked to you uh, Matt laughs all the time about how he went to some game, you know, back in 2001 and how it was sold out and he's never seen a high school basketball game like that. Uh, for people who are maybe my age, you know, I'm 23, who maybe don't fully grasp who Kevin Tolbert was, uh, can you maybe explain how big he was in high school uh, for people who may not know? Man, I mean, okay, now this is this is a fact, what I'm about to say. Obviously, he was older than LeBron. I think he was class of 01. LeBron was maybe class of 03. K Kevin Tolbert was ranked higher than LeBron James. Like, it's some it's some rankings wow. that, that goes out from like, you know, LeBron was in Ohio. He was in Michigan. KT was like the man, you know, McDonald's All-American, you know, like uh, 
five-star recruit. Could have definitely been a straight to the NBA guy. That was the year of Kwame Brown and all those guys. This was basically what we had in Michigan. He was LeBron in Michigan. You know what I mean? Like he was that big of a deal. But I think he was coming right after the Flintstones with a team and all those guys. And, you know, he just made a decision, like a hometown decision. And a lot of family, you, you, once you read the book, I can't go into everything, but you will see what really went into the mindset behind it. And, you know, just kind of building this guy and how do you navigate life once that don't work out? Like we always hear about success stories and not saying that he's not a success now, but how do you navigate life when you on this extreme high, everybody kissing your butt, you know what I mean? And all right. these people, you know, there and then it, it goes away. How do you manage that? And it's like, that's what we hope to take away. And KT was just, like I said, he was one of the all-time greats in Michigan. You can't really, you know, you can't tell the story of high school basketball in Michigan without mentioning his name. You know, I've been broadcasting since 1985. This here's a cassette tape. I have uh, the broadcast of Owasso against his team in, in 2001. And I do remember the electricity in that gym. You know, Owasso had a pretty good team for our area, but everybody was there to see what he was all about. And from the opening warm-ups, it was just incredible electricity. And he put on a show in the warm-ups, put on a show in the game, and, and definitely was one of those – phenomenal players and McDonald's all American, you know, we don't want to tell any secrets in the book because we want our listeners to go out and buy the book, but some of the things to touch upon, uh, I guess, where'd the title come from all in? I think that's where he's at in his life right now. He's all in to succeed. He's all in on happiness. He's all in on healing trauma. He's all in on being a father. He's all in on all these things. And we both feel that way. We all in on life right now, you know? So I think that's where the title comes from all in. Like I'm not worried about what people say. I'm all in to being a better person, you know what I mean? And this is liberating to tell my story. No, that's definitely cool. And going back to that that 2001 game that Ted was talking about and that Jared talked about earlier, I've brought it up a few times. Being from Corona, the three of us, you know, when when Owasso was going up to play Flint Northwestern, Kelvin Torber <laughs> and uh, Olu Famatimi, I know yeah. you definitely know about him. He went on to play at Arkansas. I mean, this was a big deal. This was a big deal. I went to watch – two or three Northwestern games that year just to go watch Torbert. I mean, that's how it was. I, I would say it's kind of like how kids recently, like Jared or the last few years, went to watch Imani Bates. You would yeah. go watch this kid play because you don't know what this kid's about to be. And that's how it was with Torbert. And that game, it's funny, one of my buddies played on that Owasso team, Eric Cameron. I knew everyone on that team, but one of my buddies, Eric Cameron, I asked him recently, I was like, uh, did you guard Torbert? And he said, no, he was guarding Famatimi that whole game. But he said one time, uh, Torbert was in the corner. I was at the elbow and Torbert started going baseline and I thought I had the angle on him. I went up to block him. He was like, Torbert basically went right through me and threw it down harder than I've ever seen someone throw a dunk down. So it's just stuff like that. And, and he was a bigger than life personality almost. And one thing that I think about is we've talked about AAU on this podcast before and kind of what it's turned into, um, you know, obviously social media, YouTube, Twitter, and all that kind of stuff. This was all like pre that. I mean, AAU was around, but it definitely wasn't what it is now. And definitely like the prep school thing wasn't what it is now. You know, you think about guys like Miles Bridges and Monty Bates and Kyle Kuzma and Devin Booker and all these other dudes who ended up going to different schools. Again, not not giving stories or uh, uh, secrets away from the book, but did Kelvin talk about that? Like just how like different his experience was, even then LeBron. LeBron was only a couple yeah. years later. And he's on the right. cover of Sports Illustrated, and he's all over YouTube and Sports Center and stuff. Did he touch on that? Just like yeah, we, we how different his experience was versus kids now, or even right yeah. after him. Even media attention, you know, it was different. Yeah, you know, what I mean, like, I mean, he didn't have a way to like now. Kids can they know their draft stock? You know, they know that before they enter the draft. I mean, at that time, it was all speculation. You know, what I mean, and that that was a thing as well. You know, what I mean, like just not knowing, you know, and feeling like I wasn't really prepared to be an NBA player. So, yeah, you talk about that. I mean, just the way that the coverage was and I was in social media, you know, so you, you know, everything at that point, it was like word of mouth still, you know, it was like, like you say, the AAU scene was much different. He played AAU, but it wasn't like how it is necessarily now where God, he would have been on ESPN easily. You know what I mean? Like his right. games would have been on there, you know, like you say, even just playing for his high school. I mean, kids rarely do that these days where how rare is it to be the number one ranked player at your position or in the nation on certain certain rankings and you still only playing for your high school. You know what I mean? He wasn't playing for a prep school or something. So right. it was just the time it was different, man. And Flint was just booming at that time. And, you know, I just, man, I hope people can, like games were being played at the IMA. They wouldn't even play at the high school. The IMA <laughs> back then was like, you know, that's 
that was a big thing back then, you know, see thousands of people in. Uh, it was it was just like you say he was a larger than life figure man i just you know, I, I tried to we tried to recapture a lot of that while also like i say dealing with some real issues uh when you started this book did you know that you were going to get into all the the trauma and sort of his life out after basketball or when you started it were you like hey this guy was a big uh high school basketball crew he had the crazy story you know great career at michigan state How, did you know it was going to kind of take the turn that it did I didn't, man. I really didn't. You know, like in the process of this, he went through a lot of life and I went through a lot of life. You know, I went from Flint to Utah to Chicago, now back to Michigan. You know, I've been in stops. I've learned. I've become a better reporter. I learned how to get certain things out of him. So it's like we both had to experience this and go through this journey together to make something that we're proud of. And we want to draw people in with that trailer. You know what I mean? Like we put a lot yeah. into it. You know what I mean? A lot of people thought it was a documentary, but it's like we had to go and do something extreme to draw the people in, you know, to really get you to understand what this guy that we're telling you about and, you know, what he meant. And I think it's, it's just, it's, it's more meaningful now, eight years later than it would have been had it come out, you know, when we initially thought, but we both fought for it and we just happy to get it out, man. We don't care. Like we will, I mean, the book sales are great. Obviously we want to make money, but the story really in the Flint community and just younger kids period. We want them. I want to get a copy to money base because he's kind of going through what, KT's right. going through. He was the last – KT was the last national uh, Gatorade player of the year for Michigan. You know, Mighty Bates was just that. So, they – it's a lot of parallels there with their careers and stuff. And those are the types of people that I want to read this story and take some away from it. You know, when, when KT was, you know, getting out of high school and, and getting recruited, was it a no-brainer because, you know, the Flintstones had just won a national championship recently and he was going to Michigan State? Were there any other colleges that were real close to having him sign? Yeah, definitely. Uh, UConn and Cincinnati, you know, and, and maybe in hindsight, that might have been the best decision because that was more of a mm -hmm. running gun style, more playing his style, athletic in the air. You know, Izzo had to set, you know, kind of the half court style. But I think he's right. at peace with playing at Michigan State. I can genuinely say this man is that this man just just went to the state championships game. He still goes. To, 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 there's no animosity towards Izzo at all with him. And most people probably would feel that way if I'm a teenager. I could have went to the NBA. I came here and I didn't go. They'll probably be pissed at this man for life. And it's, I can legitimately say that, not just for the book purpose, that this man seriously has no issues with Izzo. When even Izzo says, I can't sleep at night knowing because I, you know, KT was supposed to be that person. So, yeah, man, it's like, um, it's, just, it's, been, it's been a fun process to go through this. It really has. Yeah. Did he talk about that a little bit? Uh, like kind of that whole process? Like how how close was he? Again, I know you can probably only say so much, but how close was he to jump into the NBA? Because, like you said, I mean, guys were – back then, That it, it kind of happened fairly regularly. Or, mm -hmm. like you said, was he more like hometown decision? I'm going to go play for Izzo, follow the Flintstones, and keep that mm -hmm. legacy going. I think it was a little bit of both. You know, I just think just with the lack of media attention back then and not knowing, like, I, you couldn't talk to agents and stuff like that back then. He didn't really know his draft stock. You know, just being honest, he heard it, but it's a difference between knowing, you know what I mean? And right. He's still looking at Michigan State as like a – it's still a good choice, like you say, coming off the heels of the Flintstones and everybody. And it just made sense at the time, but, you know, he still had a decent career. It wasn't like he was a you – know, Oh, was right. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about the Flintstones. I mean, we grew up, you know, just 20 minutes from Flint, so we're very familiar with the history of Flint basketball. Uh I mean, obviously, a lot of schools are closed, and that's just across the whole state of Michigan, not only just Flint. But as somebody who's from there, do you would you say that the if we were to put together like a starting five of the best Flint players of all time to the best Detroit players, best uh, you know Grand Rapids players, do you think that the Flint uh, team is the best by far? I mean, I'm biased, so of course I'm. I'm gonna always say <laughs> I think so the best, too. Man. So. Me, and my, me and my friends argue about this literally. On I'm in a group chat, we are, we argue about this all the time. So they always want to. Uh, Talk about the five five and that. I said, well, we won it. So I mean, like, it's yeah, we we actually won. Like Glenn Rice is a champion on all levels. Like, that's my trump card. Anytime they try to bring somebody out, like Glenn Rice has won on every level. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like legendary, legendary player. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I'm a little biased, but yeah, I, I feel like I feel like we could match up with anybody. Do you think that Tolbert is uh the best player? I know he's second uh in scoring from the Flint area behind Charlie Bell, but would you in, in your opinion, do you think he's the best play high school player to ever come high out school? of Flint? I mean it's it, it's generational, man. Like a lot of the older right. guys from the city, they always say Eric Turner. Eric Turner never made it to the league, but he was he, he was he pretty was, good. You know, he had a he was he was great. You know, everybody always <laughs> talk about right. Eric Turner is like the standard of like 
any real Flint person that you talk to, they're going to say Eric Turner. But for my generation, you know, after Eric Turner, you had Glenn Rice. You know, you had that generation come with Jeff Gray and all those guys. And then, obviously, after that, you had, like, Kelvin Torbert and Jaquan Hart and all those guys. And KT was the most decorated out of them all because we never had, you know, people that won all the awards that he won. Then after that, you can go, like, you know, the, the era of Monte Morris and, you know, yep. Miles Bridges and all these guys now. So it's really generational. But if you ask me who was the best player I actually witnessed in high school, I would still say it's KT. You know, I saw Miles and stuff playing and all that. Miles is great. But KT was just different in high school, in yeah. my opinion. And I feel like even in this era, he would be even greater. You know, Eric, you, you, you mentioned it a little bit, and this is not just your general basketball player book. I mean, Kelvin – uh, he went through a lot of trials and tribulations in his life I and mean, lost his parents at a young age. Uh, obviously, you know, the letdown from the college career to the pros, you know, and then the depression set in when you when you dove deep into his mindset. Ha has he had a battle depression from a very young age? And, you know, how has he gotten out of it or is he out of it? I think uh, it happened more so after he retired. And, you know, you try to figure out what's your identity outside of basketball, which is why I think it's important because a lot of people don't understand that. Like, you know, they don't they don't take care of their mental health. They don't do things like that, really address it. And I think, you know, from him, like he's been built his whole life to be this great athlete. You know, like instead of saying go play the video games, they would tell him, like, no, you can't eat ice cream. Like, you're going to you don't need to be doing that. You need to go be out there hooping. You know what I mean? Like. Stuff like that can bother you as a kid, and it's bottled up. I don't think he was, like, depressed growing up. I think he was just focused. And I think it came to a head after he retired. You know what I mean? Like, after he retired from playing overseas, like, okay, what is my life? Seriously. You know what I mean? It's like, nah, I need to man up, and I need to tackle these issues. And I think uh, I think he's in a good space mentally right now. And I think this book is really uh, going to help him get a lot of stuff off his chest. Just from, like, I can tell you, just from walking around, we might hit a bar or something. And, like, everybody got a story they want to share with him. You know what I mean? Like, it could be good. It could be bad. Somebody go. They gonna tell me the real too. Like, man, I thought you was gonna go to state and do this. Or somebody might come up and say, man, I remember you dunked on me at this high school. Like, I've witnessed both sides, and he keeps an even kill, you know, through on both. Which me mentally, I probably couldn't. I'd be like, damn, like you really yeah. gonna just say this to my face? You know what I mean? Like, but I think uh, I think he's in a good space right now. No, oh, that's cool to hear. And I'm sure, honestly, I'm sure doing this book helped because you know yeah. sometimes you just gotta talk about it. You know, you right. got to, hey, go go through it and, and talk about right. those things. Um, let me add Jared back in here quick. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Uh, I was going to ask real quick. So last time when we talked about you, you talked about some of the other things that you're doing in your career and, and some other, I guess, endeavors that you have going on. Um, and obviously, we, we can tell through this conversation and our previous ones that you're, you're proud to be from Flint. Yeah. How big is that an aspect of the book, too, talking about? how big Flint basketball was back then, because, I mean, we, we all know how it is. People who've never been to Michigan, never been to Flint, they only know the headlines. They only know the, the negative stuff about Flint. Is there an aspect of the book uh, that's trying to shed a brighter light, I guess, on Flint that, like, yeah, back in the back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, Flint basketball was some of the best in, in the country? We don't go into, like, necessarily the historical factor, but I think we tell it through, like, how they built him up like from playing pickup games with, you know, these players, like even the women, Deanna Nolan, you know, a lot of people don't know Deanna Nolan. She was voted the top 25 WNBA player all time. She won two championships with the Detroit Shocks. He's from Flint. You know what I mean? Like KT was like kind of like a mix of all of them. You know what I mean? He was like that a younger age right after them where he was able to still be the eighth grader scrimmaging them when they came back and playing in the pro-am leagues and, you know, stuff like that over the summer where a lot of the, athletes would come. So he was kind of like the the, the, the the ripple effect of all that, that they put in. He was supposed to be the next one and take over. You know what I mean? So I think we, we, we hit on all that. We definitely do because they all poured into him. They really did. And they still do. Just like they pour in a, it's like a brotherhood. It's down there like a fraternity. You know what I mean? We all look out for each other. You know, Eric, you, you had mentioned that you conceived this idea all the way back to 2014. Uh, I'm always interested in the process, especially for writers. I mean, I can't say enough for people that can sit down and put together a book or, you know, a, a series of articles. But what was the process? Did you did you just line up uh, periodically sitting down with him with a tape recorder and just, mm -hmm. you know, just having a conversation? Did you write it all down? How, how What was yeah. the process? So the process is crazy, man. Like we uh, before I sat with him, you know, I just we we, we 
thought about would this be something that he wanted to do? And I was like, hey, let's write down like 10 or 11 bullet points of what you want to address. Because he never really seriously told his story. You know what I mean? So like, what's 10 or 11 things that define your life that you want to get off your chest? And we sat down and we crafted them. That was the start. So it gave us a direction of what we want to touch on. And I think, uh, you know, we just started meeting periodically. You know what I mean? Meeting and meeting. And sometimes we do it in Flint. Sometimes we do it in Lansing. We might go to Michigan State campus to do it. Giving it a different look just to give him different emotions and feels and vibes. And mm -hmm. honestly, like even this, it was going on all the way until late last year. You know what I mean? Like to where we got the last final interview. And I'm like, okay, this is going to take it to the next level because he felt comfortable with it. You know what I mean? That takes time to develop that relationship. Uh, no matter what your job is, if you don't have a relationship with the person, they're not going to feel comfortable talking to you. So that was huge, man. I think uh, it actually brought us closer in the process. Uh, got one, one more right question. Too. Can check it out. Oh, there it is. is. I love the cover. I do. It is cool. Uh, I have one, uh, just one more question from me. Um, I just imagine you as a little kid watching KT play. I mean, he had to have been a hero or an idol of yours of some sort. So what's it been like to kind of get to know him and basically become friends with him? What's that like? Man, it's definitely great, man, because he never – like, one thing about him, he never talked about basketball. He never, like, go sit – you'll never get him reliving the past, like, if we just chilling or – we have to pull that out. I'm like, man, what was you thinking when this happened? Or You know what I'm saying? Like, well, yeah, it definitely been a fun right. process because, like I said, he was one of the – you know, he wasn't that much, like, super, super older than me, but he's older than me enough to where, like, I watched him when I was a kid. I was, like, 12 or something when he was, like, you know, a senior in high school, like 18 mm -hmm. or something. So, yeah, it's definitely been fun just to see the evolution and – Probably him seeing the evolution of me too. You know, when I first started, I was at the Flint Journal to working my way all the way up to being an ESPN. So it's been a mutual thing, man, where we both, you know, it's, it's a legit friendship. I know he's back in, uh, involved in the community and, and back coaching too, right? Uh, he helped talk with his son a little bit here and there, but yeah. he worked for, uh, for, he actually worked with, uh, with a United Host, United Wholesale Mortgage Company. Um, so that Matt Ishbia, the billionaire from Michigan State. Oh, yeah. He's walking yeah. on to Michigan State. That's where he works at. So, yeah, he's been back okay. in the community, back in the area, back in Michigan. And like I said, I think he's happy, man. He's in a happy spot right yeah. now. That's why I think he's so open with telling the story. I know um, Marquise Gray, uh, we actually, my senior year at Corona, we played against Fleet, Flint Beecher. We did. We beat them, by the way, uh, at Corona. <laughs> but we played Marquise Gray, and he's obviously a great player. Went to Michigan mm -hmm. State, had a good career and all that kind of stuff. But I know he's back at Beecher yeah. coaching. Yeah, he coaching. Yep. Yeah, does, does Kelvin talk about that, wanting to get back into coaching? Does he want to get back involved in the game, or is it kind of, you know, he, he's past actually, that part of his yeah. life? I think he's just more so enjoying his son. His son's coming up yeah. on the scene, eighth grade, very athletic, you know, got a lot of talent. I think he's more so just enjoying that process of, you know, uh, seeing his son and letting him create his own path. Because they like two different styles of player. KT was more like power. You know, KJ's son is more like finesse. So it's like, <laughs> you know, I think he probably – He's probably trying to play like Steph Curry or something? No, I just like it, like just like you know what I'm saying. He ain't really just moving up his athleticism, not like how his dad yeah. was, but he more skilled in his dad. You know what I'm saying? He can hit floaters and threes and stuff like that. So, yeah, man, I think he more. So I don't really, I don't really think he in the coaching mindset. You know, before we uh, sign off from this this interview and talk a little bit more about your book and how to get it. I got to throw a Detroit Lion question out, okay? I mean, <laughs> we know where they're sitting in the draft. We just saw the Michigan spring game where Colin Kaepernick was down there, you know, firing darts all over the field. Is it unrealistic the Lions uh, may make a run at him as a – assign him as a backup to start yeah, I'm with? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, they just signed David David Blau, Tim Boyle. You know, they resigned their backups. And, uh, I don't know. Just for me, you know, with Jared Goff, went through uh -huh. and just the mental, you know, just coming from there and what he went through. I personally think that probably would be a distraction. You know okay. what I mean? That's yeah. just me. Because Jared Groff is already kind of like, I'm, I'm not going to say fragile, but like, like I mean, like, they trying to make him happy, like, and make him comfortable. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Which is why I don't see them bringing in a, a quarterback, you know, at number two. But I could be wrong. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not Brad Holmes. That's just me from being right. around. I think that could be a big distraction on this team um, when they're trying to make Jared Groff comfortable. I think that's really who they – they're giving him the keys to the offense again this year to kind of be that guy. So I, it just wouldn't it, for me. It seemed like it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. fair. Yeah, it would be interesting. Um, I wanted to bring up real quick. It, it's funny going back and looking at because I, I did start looking up highlights of Kelvin at Flint Northwestern and kind of like takes you back into those days or whatever. Ted talking about he's bringing bringing back his radio call of that game versus Owasso <laughs> and. <laughs> And, and, you know, we were talking about the pre-YouTube, pre-Twitter, all that kind of stuff. And it's funny to think about, like, 
if you wanted to watch highlights back then, unless it was LeBron James, you know, did show up on Sports Center once in a while, you had to watch ABC 12. Like you had to watch the local highlights or like if you wanted to read about it, you had to go to the M Live forums. I don't know. Jared probably doesn't really know what that is, but those M Live forums used to be. <sighs> they were. Brutal. I mean, that was that was like Twitter before Twitter. That stuff was just out of control. So it's just funny to go back to those days and uh, and you know remember what it was like because now it almost seems like that was like so long ago, but really wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago? But you know, talking about what this took eight years for you to write this book. I guess that you know the last thing that I've got for you. Can you just talk about like? the feeling of having it wrapped up and you know you you held it up and you could tell how proud you are and we're definitely going to yeah. pick it up and give it a read and you man, know give us give man. us the last i guess pitch for you know going out to uh it, to pick this book yeah, it up. just it, it just feels like it's authentic man like i said i think yeah. anything i put my, my my name on or he put his name on i don't want this to be a pr like i read so many books and it's like they're only addressing every good thing that happened or they're skipping over the real stuff that we want to hear and this is real and raw and i really want Really, these young athletes, man, they need to read this because, like, it's going to be more Kelvin Torbers than it is going to be LeBron James or right. Miles yeah. Bridges. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is more of a real story. You know what I'm saying? Like, and uh, I think it's just it's, it's beneficial. It's, it's real. It's raw. It's authentic. And, uh, you know, I just hope everybody – I hope everybody read it and, you know, get a deeper understanding of, you know, just uh, the mental side of, 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 of athletics as well, you know, how that can take effect on people. And uh, – just really, really, uh, really let kids enjoy, man. Let them have fun with yeah. sports. Sports shouldn't be pushed on people. I think it should be fun. We're going to talk about where you get the book, but uh, I got one final question before we do that, Eric. Uh, after this whole process has been done, was there one thing that stood out to you that, you know, surprised you, was intriguing in your conversations with Kelvin? Uh, one thing that surprised me, um, didn't mean to put you on the spot but yeah, I, I didn't know to think of one, a... like one one thing that really like surprised me um i guess like man it's humbleness you know what i mean like when you when you like praise as much as he was like i don't think on the inside internally i don't think like the perception was different than the reality of his life that's how i feel mm -hmm. like i had this big perception like he was just like oh this you know this kc this is big strong dude dunking on everybody and like he was really chill, you know, with it. Like, everybody else was doing all the talking. It's like he was chill about it. And I think, you know, that could translate into my life as well. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just be humble in the process. Like, you got you can't really get too high or too low because it can be taken away at the drop of a dime. And I think that's why he's been able to manage life because he didn't, like, read into his own press clippings and stuff like that. You know, he was – he managed to stay himself. Well, that's a great trait to have for sure. And I'll tell you, we really enjoy talking with you your second appearance here now and not a rookie with us anymore <laughs> we definitely want all our listeners and viewers to pick up a copy of the book all in uh Let's the kelvin torbert story as told to our guest right there beautiful book uh i know you have a, a signing and book release party coming up at comma bookstore mm -hmm. is, is that in flint yes yeah, downtown flint michigan comma bookstore it'll be april 9th if you guys can we have an after party as well but we'll be there from seven to nine signing books and we're going to have a panel discussion, um, just awesome. kind of talking about the process. And, you know, we just going to have some fun. Come on, just some positive, some positive energy and uh, just trying to kind of have some fun with this. Downtown Flint. I love it, man. The bricks down there. It's awesome. I'll tell you what, it's going to be I, it's going to be a good read. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, if you can't make it to uh, the, the release signing, uh, you can pick it up Amazon anywhere, right? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Yeah, you can check it out on Amazon.com. Awesome. Well, we re really appreciate the time here, uh, and we look forward to talking with you down the road, maybe a little bit more in depth uh, with the Lions as we get closer uh, to training camp and uh, hard knocks, baby. Yeah, I can't <laughs> wait. It's going to be a fun season. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Hope so. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all.